Hello, welcome to The Buzz. My name is Susie Lytle, and on this episode, we'll get you ready for the changing seasons as nature prepares in many ways. We'll visit our local squirrels as they're busy hiding acorns to get ready for winter. And they're not the only ones acting fast looking for food. Our pollinators are visiting the last of the season's flowers in the colorful prairies. While we stop and smell the flowers, we'll also see the wonderful webs that are often found nearby. So let's get a little nutty on this episode of The Buzz. Squirrels. They're nutty, fluffy, and mischievous. The best part is you can find them pretty much anywhere with mature trees. In our forest preserves, we have a few species to look out for, including gray squirrels, fox squirrels, red squirrels, and even nocturnal flying squirrels. They all look a little different, but they all have the same adaptations, making them important parts of the ecosystem. Illinois has four species of tree squirrels. First up is the fox squirrel. It's the largest of the group and has orange rusty fur all over. Next is the eastern gray squirrel, which is slightly smaller than the fox squirrel. And as the name suggests, it has a gray fur coat with a white belly. Now these squirrels can be a little tricky to identify because sometimes you'll see them with all black fur or all white fur. They're still gray squirrels, but they have a genetic mutation that turns their fur all one color. Now black and white squirrels are a rare sight to see, but we have been lucky enough to see black squirrels here at McKinley Woods Fredericks Grove. Fox and gray squirrels are hands down the most common squirrels in our area. One that's a little harder to find is the red squirrel. Red squirrels have rusty red fur and white bellies. Take a look at their faces. The white ring around their eye will help you tell them apart from their orange fox squirrel cousins. Red squirrels are smaller than both fox and gray squirrels, and they have a limited range in Illinois. They keep to the northeastern counties. Our wildlife ecologist has spotted them at Thorn Creek Woods Nature Preserve and Evans Judge Preserve along the Kankakee River. The southern flying squirrel is the smallest tree squirrel in Illinois. They are in our area, but they're more abundant in the southern part of the state. They aren't easily seen because they're nocturnal. They have grayish brown fur with white bellies and they have super big eyes because they're active at night. They need to collect all the light that they can to see. Their flying ability comes from folds on either side of their body that they can extend wide in mid air, kind of forming like a parachute. They don't quite fly, but they use this to glide from tree to tree. Fun fact, the only true flying mammals are bats. Our tree squirrels are active all year long. Except when it comes to extreme cold weather, then they'll hunker down in their nest. They can nest in tree cavities or build their own home. Their nests are called drays, and they're basically a big ball of leaves and sticks. You can start seeing drays in the trees once the leaves fall to the ground. These drays may look pokey on the outside, but on the inside, they're warm and cozy, uh, lined with grass and mosses. Each squirrel species has two breeding seasons. First one in the winter, from January to February, and then a second one somewhere between March and July. This means they can have babies twice in the spring or in the late summer. The litter size can be anywhere from two to four babies, but flying squirrels can have up to seven. These babies will become independent after 10 to 12 weeks. And overall, squirrels have short lifespans, lasting about a year or two. Life isn't all fun and games for squirrels. They do have predators looking for them as a tasting meal. They have to be on the lookout for coyotes, foxes, red-tailed hawks, and owls. Even our own pets, like cats and dogs, can attack them. But luckily, squirrels have special adaptations to keep them safe. One method is to sound an alarm call, to warn the predator it's been spotted, and to warn nearby squirrels. Then the squirrels can activate camouflage so they'll stay completely still in the shadows or on tree bark. If they have been spotted, then they can look intimidating by standing upright with tails stretched high. If all else fails, then squirrels can run! They can clock 20 miles per hour, making them experts at fleeing a bad situation. One of the most well-known facts about squirrels is that they love acorns. Even though they mostly eat nuts and seeds, they really are omnivores. For example, gray squirrels are known to eat insects, bird eggs, and even frogs. 
In the fall, squirrels have to store up food for the winter. Now putting all your acorns in one basket is an easy score for thieves. So squirrels tend to do more of a scatter hoarding approach. This means they'll hide nuts in hundreds or thousands of places. They will even dig fake holes to fool those spies that are looking to swoop in and steal a recently buried nut. Researchers have found that squirrels bury similar foods together. So acorns are in one area, hickory nuts are in another. They believe this helps them use their smell to find these nuts later in winter. But they've also been doing studies that they're using spatial cues too. So they'll look at a tree, gauge it from their home and to their hiding spot to triangulate where that secret stash is hidden. As good as squirrels are at retrieving food later in winter, they don't find everything. This is good for nature because what gets left behind becomes new growth of trees and plant life. These new plants provide shelter and food for future squirrels and other animals. For any of my bird watching fans out there, I know squirrels may not bring the most cute and friendly feelings. Squirrels love to outsmart our bird feeders, eating all the food before the birds even have a chance. Trust me, we've had tons of battles over the years, but we've come up with a few tips. Place baffles on the poles or above the feeder to protect it from squirrels. Consider changing your seed. Safflower is liked by birds, but not so much by squirrels. If that doesn't work, try upgrading your feeders to something that shuts with a squirrel's heavier weight. Lastly, add a ground feeder. By giving squirrels an easier place to feed, that gives the birds chances at some of the other feeders. Whether you love them or battle them, squirrels are important members of the forest. They are food for larger predators and also accidentally plant trees for a greener tomorrow. When you're out exploring, see if you can find all four species of squirrels. If you want to become more official, become a citizen scientist by reporting your squirrely observations to projectsquirrel.org. And don't be shy, share your squirrel neighbors with us on our Will County Wildlife Facebook group. This October, make it your mission to lace up those shoes and hit the trails for our virtual 5K. Do it how you want to, when you want to, all while soaking in some head-turning fall colors. Whether you run like a pro or like Phoebe from Friends, we don't judge. Heck, you can even walk the entire way. The goal is to get you moving outside fast or slow during this very cool time of year. The fresh fall air will do a body good. Track your 5K on a running app, then head to reconnectwithnature.org and submit your run. The first 100 people to upload their completed run get a free Harvest Hustle t-shirt, which you may or may not choose to wear on your future runs. Even if you don't consider yourself an avid runner, embrace the changing seasons to make a positive change for yourself. To learn more about Harvest Hustle and start mapping your next adventure, visit reconnectwithnature.org. The transition from late summer to early fall is what we like to call spider season. Whether you're hiking in the woods or in the open prairie, you're sure to see big, beautiful webs. Yes, at any time of year, you can probably see spiders. But by August and September, these spiders are fully grown, ready to show off their web masterpieces. The spiders that make the most intricate webs are called orb weavers. There are many different species of orb weavers in our preserves, but one of the most common is the yellow garden spider. This one has a lot of different names, so you may also have been hearing it called the yellow and black argiope, golden orb weaver, zipper spider, or banana spider. These spiders have a black and yellow bodies with long golden and black legs. The females are the big ones, measuring over two inches. And like most spiders, males are smaller with less impressive patterns. 
Yellow garn spiders are active during the day and night. They build and repair webs every day. The straight spokes of the web are non-sticky and it's used as a spider to walk around. Once the spokes are added in, then they'll go around adding the sticky circular spots. These sticky spots are what catches the insect on impact. You may also notice a zigzag pattern on the spider's web. This is called a stablementum, and scientists aren't really sure what this feature is really used for. They think maybe it helps attract prey or a mate, maybe it adds stability to the web, or it's a big enough pattern that it can alarm birds not to crash into it. After the web is complete, the spider will either sit in the middle or find a hiding spot nearby. It's waiting to feel any slight vibration. When it feels a vibration, it will go to investigate if it caught anything. Once it has caught an insect, it will wrap it up in silk, bite the tasty treat, injecting venom that will turn it into what I like to call spider soup. A female spider can catch a prey 200% of her own size. This includes flies, moths, grasshoppers, and more. These spiders may look intimidating, but don't worry, they want nothing to do with humans. They will bite if harassed, but the venom doesn't really do much to us. Scientists are actually studying their webs and venom to help with building materials and neurosciences. Plus, they are important to the grasshopper population, keeping their numbers in check. So next time you're out in the preserves, keep your eyes open for this beautiful and helpful spider. One of Illinois' nicknames is the Prairie State. At one time, there was 170 million acres of prairie in the Midwest. Today, however, Tallgrass Prairie is considered one of the rarest ecosystems, being reduced just to 1% of its original area. These original prairies were converted to farmland using the fertile soil to provide much needed food for the growing population. The prairies that are left behind were the ones that couldn't really be used for farming. Those are the ones near railroads or cemeteries. If you remember back to a past episode, we were at Vermont Cemetery, which is one of the best preserved prairies in the state. The remaining prairies may not look like much, just a bunch of grass. And that visual is not completely wrong. 80% of prairies are made of grasses, sometimes with as many as 40 to 60 different kinds of species. The remaining 20% is made of diverse flowering plants, up to 300 species. That kind of diversity brings tons of wildlife, from large deer to tiny insects. The time for these flowers to shine is midsummer into fall. The first round is full of milkweed blooms, cone flowers, bergamot, and more. Then come late summer, early fall, a new group takes that place. We'll be meeting the yellows, purples, and whites that are crucial for pollinators right now. It is the last chance for the butterflies, bees, and more to fuel up on food before migrating, overwintering, or ending their life cycle. Plus, before there were pharmacies around every corner, our ancestors used these same plants to help ease illnesses. Some worked, and others didn't. Many of the flowers we're gonna to see today are part of the Asteraceae family, consisting of asters, daisies, sunflowers, and goldenrods. The important thing to note about these are that they're not your typical flowers. So these flowers are called composite flowers. So if we look at this flower, it's not actually just one flower. Each petal is its own individual flower. And this center part, that's made up of tiny flowers too. The center part is called a disc flower and these little petals are called ray flowers. That whole part is called a flower head. An iconic fall flower is the sunflowers. Sure, you can go to a sunflower farm and see endless picturesque views, but did you know that we have 70 native species of sunflowers right in our own wild prairies? They can hybridize and be a little hard to ID, but one of the most common species is sawtooth sunflower. This sunflower can grow up to 12 feet if it's growing on its own. Generally, when it grows into colonies, it can grow up to five feet. It has a smooth stem with a waxy coating, and like the name suggests, it has little sawtooth edges on the leaves. This is a favorite among bees, as it provides pollen and nectar as a reward. 
Sunflowers can be aggressive since they grow from a rhizome stem. This creates colonies, like seen here, that can dominate the landscape. There are many different kinds of asters in our forest preserves, both in the woodlands and the prairies. The word aster in Greek actually means star, which plays along with their appearance and their shape. Asters can be found in many different colors, so they can be white, blue, pinks, purples, they can be big, they can be small. One of my favorites is the New England aster, and it's easy to tell apart from the others because of its size and its colors. So this one can bloom throughout October, it can be four feet tall, and has these flower heads that can be up to two inches wide. New England aster has acids inside that are made up of anti-inflammatory properties. So this was once used as a poultice to help uh, aching pains or brewed in teas to help reduce fevers. Goldenrod's yellow blooms are one of my signs that summer is coming to a close. There's a lot of different species of goldenrods found along roadsides, forests, and prairies. They sometimes get blamed for seasonal allergies, but that blame should be put on ragweed. Ragweed has airborne pollen that relies on the wind to spread it around to complete pollination. Goldenrod, however, has sticky pollen that stays inside the flower. It relies on bees and butterflies to do the pollination and get it spread from plant to plant. Goldenrods don't only benefit the pollinators, but also leaf-eating insects, like a variety of moth caterpillars and beetles. And there's one fly that depends on goldenrod to complete its life cycle. It's called the goldenrod gall fly. The adult fly lays its eggs in the goldenrod stem. An egg hatches and the little larva starts eating inside the stem. The goldenrod reacts by sending in more cell production around that eating area. This forms a gall. Sometimes you won't notice it right away. It takes a few weeks and along the seasons to get bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually becoming the size of a ping pong ball. Usually there's one gall per plant. This one gall doesn't hurt the plant. This little insect will stay in that ball all winter and then come next spring will emerge as a new adult. But sometimes it doesn't survive the entire time. You'll see these galls can be almost pecked out into this little hole, and that means a woodpecker has made that little fly larva a tasty snack. There are many different kinds of bone set in our preserves, all that have these white, dull white flowers on top of tall stalks. Now this is also part of that Asteraceae family, so these flowers aren't those typical flowers. These are really just like the center parts. They are a favorite of the usual suspects of pollinators, but also flies and wasps. The name bone set has a few origin stories. First up is the concept of doctrine of signatures. So this was a theory that if the plant looked like a particular body part, it could be used to treat ailments of said body part. So for bone set, the stem is rigid and the leaves kind of encase it, sort of looking like a backbone. So they thought that bone set should be used to help set bones. A little bit of a stretch, but this next one makes a little bit more sense. Another story is that it was helped to ease pain for a 19th century fever called bone breaking fever. It was this intense fever that made you feel like all your bones were breaking. This plant may not look the most inviting with its spiny and hairy exterior. Pasture thistle is a native thistle that can be found along roadsides, abandoned fields, and even high quality prairies. What sets it apart from non-native thistles is the underside of their leaves. They are covered with tiny little white hairs. This thistle is a favorite among butterflies and bees, and personally, every time I see it in bloom, there's a monarch nearby. And the American goldfinch likes eating the seeds of this thistle and taking the little fluffs to put in its nest. Let's not forget about those grasses. First up is the big blue stem. This is actually our state prairie grass. Big blue stem can reach eight feet tall and in the summer can look bluish green as it sways in the wind. Come fall, it turns like a yellow bronze color. 
It's also called turkey foot because the little seed heads on top split out to make three little feet. The other species that's dominant in our prairies is Indian grass. It's a little different than big blue stem as it has a big fluffy seed head on top. It can be about the same size or a little smaller, but generally the colors are different. Indian grass will stay brown and bronzy. These grasses provide great food sources for grasshoppers and great shelter for different bird species. The next stage for these flowers is to become seeds. The beautiful colors will transform into big balls of fluff that rely on the wind to carry it far away from the parent plant to start somewhere new. The Forest Preserve will sometimes collect these seeds to use in future restoration efforts. These seeds can be planted when transforming farm fields back into wild prairies. By converting a little piece of your yard back into prairie, we can help regrow some of those grassland acres, providing sanctuaries for birds, butterflies, bees, and so much more. Thanks for joining us as we looked at sticky webs, showy flowers, and adorable squirrels. Make sure you take advantage of the changing seasons by getting outside and seeing this action in real life. You can participate in our popular Woods Walk program or join us for a hike. Check out our website at reconnectwithnature.org to see when the fall color hikes, bird hikes, and other hikes are coming up. I hope to see you at a program, but until then, I'll see you next time on The Buzz.